Okay, welcome to the Burger and Forum, everyone. Um, remember, there's uh, tea and coffee there for free. A um, couple of announcements. Uh, one very important announcement is that um, Rich Bitch, play by uh, Rachel Lynette, a dark intersectional comedy, is uh, that will be being performed uh, tomorrow, Friday at 7.30, Saturday at 7.30, and on Sunday at 2 o'clock in the Miller Theatre. And uh, next week's Burger and Forum is also very exciting. It's um, the winner of the student uh, wit and wisdom competition sponsored by Phi Beta Kappa, that is Monica Nowak, and she will be giving a talk on um, gender bias in the Roman Polanski film, Rosemary's Baby. So be here for that. And today we're very happy to have an uh, outside speaker, distinguished outside speaker, uh, Dean Fule Fulehan, I hope I pronounced Good. that correctly. Well done. Uh, for more than 30 years, uh, Dean held senior staff positions in the New York State Assembly. Um, he was the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at the University of Al Albany College of Nanoscale Technology and Engineering. He was Director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, the former Deputy Mayor of New York City, and he's currently a Senior Fellow at the CUNY Institute for State and Local Governance. So we're very happy to have him. Please give him a good welcome. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. And he will be talking about New York City during COVID, obviously. So thank you. Uh, hopefully it's working. Everybody can hear me. And on Zoom, somebody will let me know if there's a problem. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to be back at Elford. Uh, the contrast between Elford and New York City is somewhat stark, but... Uh, <laughs> it's good to see, and it's good to remember that there are these two very different worlds. Um, also, thank you, and and I really want to thank Gary Ostrow, who was an exceptional professor, um, was kind enough uh, to invite me, and uh, and the president, who I, I know he's out of town today, but we had a very nice conversation a little over a week ago, um, talking about what's confronting Elford, what's confronting the City University, on, uh, and we're seeing it across the country, the things that are confronting right now, uh, post-COVID, if there is such a thing, on higher education. Um, but it was really nice that uh, the invitation came, and uh, and I'll I'll say a few more words about it. But that uh, Gary picked the topic, um, and that may not surprise any of you. Uh, some background: I am currently a senior fellow at the City University of New York Institute for State and Local Governance. It was formed about ten years ago by former city and state senior government officials. It's a public policy think tank uh, with a very strong focus on criminal justice across the country, but also equity, um, government finance, and budgeting. Uh, and I did have the experience and the privilege of serving in New York City government for the entire eight years of the Bill de Blasio administration. I was first deputy mayor during the second term from 2018 through 2021, obviously including the pandemic. And during the first term from 2014 through 2017, I was the director of the mayor's office of management and budget. Um, before my New York City experience, I, I did serve uh, for two years at SUNY Albany. And more important, I think, to the topic, um, before that, for many years, I was on the staff of the New York State Assembly, uh, managing for the Speaker of the Assembly and the Assembly Majority, both the Ways and Means Tax and Budget staff and the Central Program Policy and Council staffs. Uh, that role in New York State government, and it's timely since they're doing it right now. That role in New York state government involves negotiating what is normally a very contentious state budget and major legislations. So having senior level policy and budget experience at both New York City and New York State and senior level management experience at New York City provides a very unique perspective. And certainly a unique perspective on COVID. New York City, 
most local governments are the direct service provider in our system, I think. I've met several mayors, former mayors in here. I have a feeling there are, there are many, at least five, who've been mayors of Alford. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Okay, not, not quite. But, but it doesn't matter whether it's New York City or Alford, New York. That's where the service is provided in our government. It's where government and our residents interact. Um, it's not something you really pick up in Albany, and I'm guessing it's not something you pick up in, in, in Washington. Every day, you see the benefits of government action, and every day, you confront the failures and the problems. Every day in New York City, something positive and something negative. Events that cannot be avoided. It's not abstract. And I... I'll make this offer. Just walk around New York City, as I often did with the mayor of New York City, and you hear directly from New York City residents what they think. Sometimes it's wonderful. Sometimes it's absolutely horrible, but there's no shyness about it. So to frame the conversation, and forgive me about this, but I, a little discussion of New York City government. New York City government is the direct service provider for 8.5 million residents, about 380,000 city employees with a current $106.5 billion budget. Unlike most major municipalities, New York City combines under one government service that are normally provided by many different overlapping entities. The New York City mayor, is directly responsible for the services that we all quickly recognize and complain about often, police, fire, sanitation, roads, bridges. But in New York City, a strong mayor form of government, the mayor is also responsible for K through 12 education. And I'll come back to that. New York City is the social service provider, including temporary family assistance, emergency assistance, rental assistance, tenant, protections, including the right to counsel, SNAP, food programs, child care, child preventive services, foster care, all vital services during COVID. Many of these services provided through a vast network of nonprofits throughout the city. New York City provides homeless services, including the only government in New York State and one of the few in the nation that provides the right to shelter with a current census of over 72,000. It is the reason Manhattan hotels and hotels throughout the five boroughs were used to provide shelter for homeless families during the pandemic. New York City provides housing, including new developments, restoration, and affordability. And independently, the New York City Public Housing Authority has 340,000 residents. The city provides vital environmental services, including water, sewer, sanitation, all quality of life issues that the city maintained throughout the pandemic. It's the building regulator, instituting right before the pandemic major energy efficiency standards and stopping for a brief period construction during the early months of the pandemic. The city operates an extensive park system that was used by residents during the pandemic even with the temporary closure of many playgrounds. The city maintains the road system. During the pandemic, it allowed the Department of Transportation to be responsible for closing major streets throughout the city, opening them up to neighborhoods, and establishing an extensive outdoor dining program for restaurants throughout New York City, literally changing the landscape of the city. The city is a major taxing authority relying on property tax, personal and corporate taxes, sales taxes to fund most of the city services. All these taxes suffered serious declines early in the pandemic or have become concerns in the post-pandemic period about the future financial health of the city. And very important for this conversation, New York City government is the public health provider through the Department of Health and Mental Health. And New York City maintains the largest public hospital system in the country. New York City health and hospitals serving 1 million patients a year 
at 11 hospitals and 70 locations across the city with 45,000 employees. Health and hospitals led the response when New York was at the center of the pandemic. It led the extensive test and tracing and with the Department of Health, the successful vaccination of New York. Early in our administration, when there was no discussion of the pandemic, we made a commitment to the future of our public hospital system, maintaining the hospital capacity and a much, much larger city subsidy. Many others argued for closing hospitals and reducing our bed capacity. Just one of the many decisions before the pandemic that affected how we responded during the pandemic. So, when Gary and I discussed a few topics for this presentation, as I said earlier, not surprisingly, he picked the most. Uh, focusing on the pandemic and New York City, as we all know, the city was the early epicenter of the pandemic for our nation. Everything on that list of city responsibilities that I just outlined, every aspect of New York City government was affected by COVID. Every service was affected by COVID. Understanding the role of the New York City government, the life-changing consequences of COVID, and the city's response will take a great deal of reflection and more time. So with Gary's urging, with your help, I begin my part of that process this afternoon. Recognizing that even as we look back, we still must address the many serious and immediate public policy issues that are a direct result of the pandemic. For today, I'm going to offer some additional top line reflections on a few of the important aspects of the pandemic, the health crisis, the economic crisis, the city budget, and New York City schools. But I'm recognizing, as we all do, that city government was also forced to confront many other vital issues. What our former health commissioner, Dave Chotsky, called the parallel pandemics, mental health, structural racism, overdose crisis. Add to that list the distribution of healthcare, education, other vital services and resources, the resulting social justice movement, critical learning loss in education, lack of trust in government. Many of these events were sequential. You could see them happening, one crisis, moving on to the next major challenge. And many were happening at the same time. Government and all of us individually struggling to cope. Nothing had prepared us for what happened in New York, our nation, or our world. But at the same time, and it will become evident, it was we were the beneficiaries of a infrastructure and a human capital, a human infrastructure that had been built that allowed the city to adapt to the crisis. The health crisis, the center crisis, the hardships, tragedies, the fear, the struggles for the residents of New York. Our public health and hospital network within the city, working every day for hours with the mayor, city, senior city hall, health and operations staff, saving lives, providing emergency care, and trying to understand the disease, its spread, its consequences with little and often confusing messages from the federal government. And a New York state government with its own set of conflicting roles and unfortunate, unfortunately, a contentious history with city government. Confirmed and probable deaths in New York City are now at 45,146. And hospitalizations are 212,795. In the early part of the pandemic, when hospital rates and deaths peaked in late March and in early April of 2020, the constant sirens when no other traffic was on New York City streets. You could go out, I would, place on, on Lexington and 36, and you look down Lexington and there was nothing. There were no cars, no traffic. It's not the way any of us think about Manhattan or hopefully ever do again. But during that whole period, what you did hear in those early months were the constant, the constant sirens. Morgues, funeral homes, burials beyond capacity, and adding to the crisis. 
one day with the covers of the New York Times, New York Post, New York Daily News, all covering just that one part of, of the crisis. The desperate attempts to find personal protection equipment, PPE, and running down every option anyone suggested to get more protection for healthcare workers and first responders. A supply crisis that would reappear in many ways over the next two years. The many attempts to impose safety protocols, no visitation to hospitals, closing of schools, playgrounds, public gatherings, restaurants, stores, the attempt to enforce these rules, and again, based on limited and often confusing information in the early stages of the pandemic. And then the reoccurrences, the new variants when it appeared to be over, the forced reconsideration of decisions that we once assumed were behind us, including the Omicron variant at the end of our administration in 2020. Arguments over finding the balance among the many competing needs, constant questioning of protocols, restructuring the management of healthcare operations during the pandemic, trying to build consensus. And the one key conclusion, the success throughout the entire pandemic, the dedication, the heroism of healthcare workers, frontline and essential workers under often overwhelming conditions. The recognition by New Yorkers as seen early in the pandemic with the 7 p.m. clapping and banging of pots in recognition of that effort. Throughout the entire period, the majority of New York City employees, the majority of our workforce in the city, working every single day. And the establishment of a citywide effort for testing. New York City test and trace reached over 30% of the New York City population and the very successful efforts on vaccination. For us, the foundation, the recovery of New York. Citywide effort using every available site and every available outreach. Currently 90.5% of the New York City population has received at least one dose. Almost 16 million doses by the end of our administration in that massive effort now reaching 19.7 million. The economic crisis. Again, in the early months, more severe and sudden than the Great Recession of only 10 years earlier, more severe in that sudden moment than what happened in the fiscal crisis of the 1970s. A crisis that centered on those providing direct services, lower income individuals, head of households and families. In May 2020, the unemployment rate in the city reached an unimaginable 21%. And with nearly 2 million jobs lost in April and May. That started turning around in June, but it has taken the city three years until really the very most recent employment numbers to again reach the levels we had in February 2020, more than 4.6 million jobs. It was also a fiscal crisis because of that. During the early months of the pandemic, at a time of great need, we were confronted with massive retrenching of services, severe declines in revenue and projected revenue. In a few months, our revenue estimates declined by $9 billion from, from about a $64 billion base. At that point, the city was only receiving partial temporary relief from Washington, directly related to the billions of dollars the city was spending on COVID. We used our historic levels of reserves that we had built up. We imposed furloughs on non-union employees and renegotiated with unions on their contract terms and postponed long overdue pay increases with the unfortunate threat of needing to lay off up to 22,000 city employees. New York State and the MTA entered markets for short-term operating cash, something not seen or envisioned in decades and a governor who refused the same option for the city of New York. That all changed dramatically with the federal government action in early 2021, with major stimulus actions by the president and Congress. Funding that is still supporting New York City, New York State, the MTA, all schools in our state, and higher education, but will soon end creating its own financial challenges. Also, city revenues, turned out to be more resilient, 
they were more resilient because of the uneven hardship of the pandemic, where the wealthiest New Yorkers gained significant income and capital wealth. Um, part of what I wanted, I said I'd come back to New York City schools, and I thought it's one of the oversight areas that I had the responsibility for as first deputy mayor, and obviously was a constant and constant part of the process through the entire period of COVID and the post-pandemic period or whatever we're calling this, we're the same, where we continue to try to confront what happened over these past three years. Uh, the school district is, one, is about 1 million students. 1,700 schools through 1,400 buildings. Uh, the only municipal government in New York State that where the mayor completely controls has complete jurisdiction over the school district. It's the reason for constant improvement in K through 12 education <clears throat> since state law changed and the move to mayoral control in 2002 until the pandemic. It's the reason the former mayor Bill de Blasio was able to run on a policy of universal pre-K and implement it for 60,000 four-year-old children in the first two years of his administration, creating a new grade, addressing a serious aspect of inequality and improving education outcomes. And then follow up in the second term with an effort to expand to all three-year-old children even during the pandemic. It is the reason school decisions during the pandemic were the responsibility of the mayor. All the decisions made on the advice, recommendations, debates, arguments, consensus within the broader school community, the city hall senior staff, including myself, my role, my senior staff, public health team, first responders, emergency management, communications. The school community, Includes the school chancellor, senior management, many union represented, representing the city employees, <coughs> excuse me, involved in the daily life of the school, teachers and their support staff, principals and their senior support staff, food service, custodial, maintenance, school safety, transportation, and the parents struggling to understand the risks for their children and family, childcare, and work. The first reported case of COVID in New York City, late April, early, early March. The mayor closed schools on Monday, March 16th, and schools moved to a place that no one had conceived completely remote learning. That date became contentious, arguing that it should have been even earlier, and later questioning why and the length of the closure. School buildings with city workers became centers for daily emergency food and provided in-person learning and children care for essential workers during the early period of the pandemic. We opened schools again to voluntary in-class learning in September 2020, working with unions with strong requirements on ventilation, mass requirements, temperature reading, cleaning, spacing, and a major citywide effort of daily monitoring of every school for incidents of COVID with parental notification. That resulted in temporary closures of classrooms, temporary closures of schools, and for a period, the entire system as the daily reported rates of COVID increased. 330,000 students participated. Efforts at remote learning intensified as the city purchased over 500,000 iPads and thousands, tens of thousands more of laptops established distribution systems and moved to try to get Wi-Fi to all communities. We also reinvented summer school in 2021, serving 200,000 students with enrichment programs that has become a permanent improved summer education experience. We completely reopened schools in September 2021 with the, again the support of the broad school community unlike many other major cities that were struggling or completely unable to open. With a vaccine mandate requirement on the workforce and most employees participate. Mass mandates, ventilation requirements in classrooms and throughout the school and continuing citywide efforts of daily monitoring of classrooms and every school for incidents of COVID, which this time resulted in very limited closure. 
So with these observations, in conclusion, in each of these areas, dedicated workers, using the best information they could get, moving forward the recovery of New York and changing the city. Other important policies continue. The school leadership, which changed in the middle of the pandemic, the entire school community and City Hall continued to work through what appeared to be other insurmountable problems. Expanding mental health services, expanding social emotional learning, adopting culturally sensitive curriculum and changing admission requirements to address equality. Expanding athletics, reforming school safety protocols, establishing and implementing public school bus coverage, mandating the purchase of electric school buses, and expanding universal pre-K to three-year-old children. And finally, after years of promising equitable distribution of dollars, with the federal money that we received, the city funded at 100% the fair student funding formula, and the state committed to the final phase in and fully funding of the campaign for fiscal equity, the Court of Appeals decision. There are many lessons still to be learned, and I certainly have a great deal left to understand about preparing for the unexpected, the importance of public health, the importance of emergency management, addressing mental health, using technology, addressing inequality in public policy decisions. Communicate and recognition of what we don't know, the importance of federal leadership and the recognition of our dependence on government that actually provides the vital services. Um, so with those incomplete observations, uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to start the process of reflecting on this. I thank again, Gary and the university for offering me the opportunity and forcing me really to look back on this. And with that, I look forward to your questions. Um, thank you, Dean. And um, if people have questions, let me give you the mic so that the people on Zoom can hear them. Thank you for that. Um, this may be an unfair question, but given that during the pandemic, many, um, especially healthcare workers, expressed or experienced a lot of stress. Um, some have mentioned, you know, having PTSD from working that time, and many have left the professions altogether. Can you conjecture, comment on how you think stress is going to affect the long-term health of people um, in New York City and the longevity of people in the healthcare professions? So there are no unfair questions. It's a great question. I wish I had a very good answer for you. Um, I Look, we, I think everyone here, you're seeing a higher education setting. I mean, there were clearly mental health issues and, and that we have to deal with, not just for our children and the student population, but those workers who were on the front line. And there's no question. Uh, there's a contentious battle happening in Albany now on the state budget, which is over Medicaid and uh, in reimbursement rates for particularly those hospitals that serve the most needy population, high levels of Medicaid. Um, but there's also a question of pay, which, you know, there's a lot of that workers are at the low end of the pay scale that, uh, that support our health care. Um, I think what we learned was how important it was. It was a vindication actually for, for us that the public health and a public hospital system in New York City was vital. And I, I can't imagine what would have happened if we had actually done the retrenchment that, that good government groups and other people have been advocating for earlier. We used every single space. I mean, if you listen to the health officials who are running health and hospitals, they turn the places around. Every square foot of it was used. The floors that had not been used for years were opened up. As you know, we had uh, we had the U.S. government, the military came in, and we opened up other things, but other places, but none of those had the capacity to do what a hospital could do. So, I look. We need public health is another huge one of those uh, 
problems that the country has to confront. And part of it is recognition of what, of what those workers went through. And I think we're going to be confronting that for some time. It's not a great answer, but like, is it important? Of course it's Gary. Can you comment on what was at least occasionally a contentious relationship with the governor of New York? So I did allude to that. Um, I was particularly annoyed with aspects of it. I mean, I, look, it's unfortunate. Um, when you're in a period, federal government too, I mean, we don't have to make it personal. When, when, when it's a, when there's a crisis, and this was clearly a crisis, when there was information and the information was confusing, um, when there was a supply shortage that was affecting residents, affecting governments, affecting healthcare, when all these things are happening, you needed a coordinated effort. And, and you know, we struggled to get that. And I think that's, that's the major that's the right major ramification of that. Do personalities get involved? Sure, but 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 you know, there's a lot of people working. There's a lot of other infrastructure there that should be able to address that, and that was hard to do. And that's something we need to learn a lesson. I know Gary was looking for an actual specific incident. We have a question over here. <laughs> there are too many people watching on Zoom. Okay, so um, this goes like okay. So you spoke about New York City schools, but I only heard you speak about elementary schools because I'm from New York City, and the high schools. Um, I didn't hear you really speak about like the high schools and the middle so, schools. So, so I'm sorry. I I meant to. I mean, look, I the the protocols that I discussed there were about every <laughs> single school. I did, I did put an emphasis on early education actually not even elementary, but early education, which is one of the accomplishments of our administration and we take credit for. Um, the, the, everything I went through in terms of the closure and the, I mean, you know this, you, mm -hmm. you lived it. Um, the, the, in, in, the, the in school, not in school, applied to not just elementary, but every single part. Unfortunately, high school, when we, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the second year, when we did the voluntary schooling, high schools were the, unfortunately the last to open. When mm -hmm. the closure occurred, when the positivity rates were spiked up, uh, late November, early December, high schools were the last to reopen. I think it may, I mean, you correct mm -hmm. me, I think it was like February. Mm -hmm when the elementary schools were opening very quickly after the break and high schools, uh, it, it, took to, uh, it took to February. Again, this was the painful balancing act of trying to figure out how to, how to reopen schools. And we still had a, a community broadly, while we had over 300,000 students who returned, Let's be honest, the vast majority did not. The vast majority yeah. of families did not think it was appropriate or safe enough. It's the reason when I said that the vaccine, I mean, we looked at the vaccines as the recovery. That's how New York City was going to mm -hmm. recover. That's how we were able to say in September of 2021, it doesn't matter. We're opening schools and everybody's coming back because we understood the hardship and the difficulty of remote learning. But you know, you should give me your observations yeah, so and your criticism. I actually was in student government. So we spoke about these things in high school. And one thing that we spoke on was that because of how long school was closed and the different options they had, which you couldn't come to school unless you was vaccinated, a lot of the um overall grades for the high schools, percentages of who was passing and graduating went down. So in my high school, my principal actually did some grade frauding and got in trouble for it but then she got like awarded to like deputy superintendent for this year so it wasn't really like i don't feel like they really put as much effort into like high schools as they did like elementary when a pandemic was like over because the um percentage of our grades for passing and stuff didn't really change only changed because some of the principles alternated it to where you could pass and you 
could only pass to graduate. So thank you for serving in school government. My favorite group to meet with, which beat me up the most, was a group, we were always the students in high school who would come in and appropriately challenge us on equity issues, on admissions issues, on health and safety, school safety agents, and how, and all those things, very important. So thank you. Um, we did listen. Did we, did we achieve Good success here. Yeah, this was a struggle. And it, it, every aspect of it was a struggle. So I, my answer back to you is, I think, yeah, we recognized it. It's the reason we said in September 2021, well, again, many, many cities were struggling to open schools. Many school districts were having serious problems. We worked out issues with with our unions, and we came back and said, everybody has to come in because yeah, you're right. There were serious problems, and we're going to be confronting for a long time uh, the what was clearly a learning loss. However, we characterized it, as well as all the emotional and mental health issues that we have to confront with that. So it's it takes even more effort. I'm, I'm not denying the effort. Just going back into school is not enough. There's a huge amount of effort. So as you're in the midst of this, um, you know, many of us, you know, here, like I watched the the governor's daily uh, announcements and addresses, and he kept warning, like the rest of the country, look, guys, this is coming to you. What was your perception? Do you think the rest of the country, as, as they're watching what was happening in New York City, really was taking it seriously, like fully believed what was coming? Um, and, and when it finally did spread and hit, what was your, like, reaction? Did you guys get asked a lot? Like, wow, help, help, help now. I'm just kind of curious from your perspective, being in the middle middle of it and trying to tell other people, I mean, did, did you feel people listened? Um, took you as a model? I think your answer. <laughs> it's a good answer. Uh, I, so and, uh, we were worried about what was happening in New York City and every day. And again, the reoccurrences were happening, the struggles we just talked about at schools. Um, uh, you know, I, did the rest of the country, I think it's mixed. I think there are places in the country that did see it and understood it coming. Uh, again, there was a real problem in the public health information and what we were getting from the federal government. And it took a long time for that to start to start to work its way out. And by that time, COVID had really spread to the whole country. So I think it's a mixed, but I do think it says, okay, there are lessons to be learned here and we have to figure that out. And one is, and one is really, again, the local level providing these services, local government providing these services, local public health agencies providing these services, schools trying to teach. Like, how do you do that? You need, you need federal support. You need financial federal support. Place would have, I mean, there was no possibility of the kind of recovery we witnessed without the federal intervention. I know there's a lot of criticism of the federal stimulus, and the consequences of that, but we need to remember what where we were when that happened. Well, let me put my hat first. Uh, I hope that you are enjoying your time here in Alfred. I hope that in- I, like, I am. Thank, thank, again, thank you for inviting me back. Uh, I hope that in like two hours, you don't enjoy that much and you're not happy because I don't know if you're a baseball fan, but a New York team is playing my San Francisco Giants. And I, <laughs> But uh, on all seriousness, uh, I have two questions for you. The first one is, uh, I don't have uh, many opportunities to talk to somebody that, that is uh, in part of driving a, a bus with a lot of people in there. And especially when this bus is, is having a crisis, uh, a health crisis like, like COVID. And I wanted to, to ask you uh, personally, how, my first question is personally, how, where do you draw strength? How how do you? Because in some point you you have like containers of of of, of I mean containers being used as 
morgues and and we have a all this situation the the equity gap is is increasing because the, the, that's what COVID did. So so my question is, I mean that for me putting myself in your shoes, I will have to some kind like kind of like put myself a part of my humanity, not not to be like completely freeze and and shock about the situation that's happening. So I wanted to ask you as a person, how how do you draw that strength? Where where do you get it? How how was your approach? And my second question is uh, Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to give you both? Or no, you go to... ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. The second question is, is there something that you regret not doing? Or is there something that you regret not fighting for with respect to the decisions that were made? Okay, so let's let's start on the first. You never lose your humanity. And the people I worked with and the team never lost their humanity. And you never worry about, you never stop worrying about that body, that person who died and the family, and how to deal with that crisis they're going through, you, you never do. It, it's an honor and a privilege that we have. Yes, it was not anything we anticipated, ever expected or wanted or ever would want on anyone else. But, but it's, it, look, it's an amazing city. It's an amazing place and the residents were all struggling. You know, we, every single, everybody, everyone had different aspects, whether they were in the, whether they were in the healthcare community and struggling in the hospitals. I mean, parents struggled. They struggled with what kind of work and how do you do childcare? You recognize that you're, you have a privilege and a team of dedicated people around you who have humanity as one of the goals. And that's how you move. And, and you understand that every single resident had, had their own crisis, their own serious problem they were dealing with. And we had to figure out how to help them, how to take that, the, 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 the <laughs> wealth of New York, the infrastructure, the human capital wealth of New York, and use that to get through this crisis. Um, on, on, you know, I, this is part of reflecting. What are what are what could you do differently? What would you do differently? You, you know, we we were operating with insufficient knowledge and early on without the resources, and we still tried to do the best we could. But of course, were the mistakes certainly. Do you go back and think? I think the better way to look at it is say, okay, how do how do we go forward? How do we address those crises that we have right now? How do we deal with what happened to our students who were lo losing, literally losing things in those in those years? How do we deal with the healthcare community that did sacrifice so much? I think for me, that's the that's the better way to look at it. Yes, thank you, uh, Dean. It sounds like you've had uh, a great experience. Uh, you walk the walk. And you did a great job with that down in New York City. Here in Alfred, we had our own team here, the first responders and other individuals that were really concerned about how can we get through this without losing lives of our students and our faculty and our community. What did you learn from your experience that would prepare us for the next time, the next pandemic, so we could be better prepared both here in Alfred and also in New York City for what you experienced? Look, I, uh, we we all this was unimaginable. So now we know that you know there are public a public health infrastructure is a really important vital piece. I think we all knew that, but but when you go through the the of the moment budget crisis and the but the of the moment budget decision making, do you make that a part of it? Do you worry about that kind of planning? Do you force? Is there another group that's having that conversation? And saying, okay, how do you deal with this issue? I, it's it's planning and it's recognition and it's it's government at all levels uh, helping, and that was not there, and we need that. And when it happens, you see the positive consequences. 
So again, I think the positive action that was taken in early 2021 changed, changed the way we responded. Look, the vaccine effort was amazing. And, and, and that, was a, that was a federal initiative that, that worked and we made it, we knew that was the recovery for New York City. At least that had to be. There. And it was, it was an incredibly successful operation with all the concerns legitimate concerns that people had about the uh, trusting of public health and trusting of government, it still became an incredibly successful operation. I say, it's one o'clock. I know that some people are going to have to leave. Uh, we don't, that doesn't mean we have to finish the question and answer session, but let's give Dean another round of applause for thank, for oh, thank you. Thank you.